Twitter is also there. Uh, you know, Tina Sir is there. Uh, so let me just uh, start by introducing our chairperson, Mr. Swan Sati Sir. He is from Katak. He is a professor in, professor in psychiatry, and uh, he is leading this Thursday musing. So he has been a national advisory board member of IAPP, chairman, membership subcommittee of Indian Psychiatry Society, life fellow, IIO PM UK. He has organized answers twice. Private Secretary Conference, uh, NCA, IPI, NCIASC. He has been formerly Vice Chairperson, IAPP, President, IPS, is known in Odisha branch. Editor of Industrial Psychiatry Journal of India. He has chaired various positions in all the leading psychiatric organizations. He is life fellow of uh, most of them, including Bhuvneshwar Music Circle. He has a number of lectures. Presentations to his credit and winner of Madhu Swabhiman and four Avenues of Service Award. Over to you, sir. Please take on the proceedings. Thank you, Ali. It is Ali. Yes. Where from this KKS is coming? Yes. Thank you, Ali. So, welcome everybody to the eighth session of the Thastu Museum. And today we have a great speaker, Dr. Shubho. And it too, he, he can be using. We have got many joints of psychiatry present in this meeting. And it is always a pleasant experience to introduce Adim and Amri. Slide power, slide circle. Dr. Alim Siddhi, Siddiqui, Lucknow, Nawabon ki Nagar, Lucknow, Pele Aap Kehne Wale, Director of Healthy Minds, Neuropsychiatry and Behavioral Science Center, Lucknow, Visiting Professor of Psychiatry, Eras Lucknow Medical College and Hospital, Lucknow and GSB in College, Kanpur, Direct Council Member of Indian Psychiatric Society, Best Faculty Army Team Borsis, Lucknow, Finance Secretary, Indian Medical Association, Lucknow, and Finance Secretary of IAPT UP, and UK Uttarakhand chapter. Alim Siddiqui, the vibrant moderator of all the programs, all the fucking meetings. Welcome. And now we have with us Dr. Amrit Patojasi, the smart, and who I have got the pleasure and privilege of being in his company in Bhubaneswar. We work in the same department. He is eminent neuropsychiatrist and psychotherapist. And is a wellness consultant. He is a professor and chief consultant of neuropsychiatry in High Tech Medical College, Amini Hospital, and Julian Trust Clinic. He is a direct council member of IPS2. He is editor of Odisha Journal of Psychiatry, which has been indexed. He is the chief coordinator of UNICEF WH and IPS initiative on telemedicine and psychosocial management during COVID 19. We have got the vibrant Amrit Padrasi here. And with this, I have the privilege to welcome our chairperson. Dr. Hak Nizam. When he asked him to share his CV, he chose the best he is. And he told it, nothing, you write something. But he is such a great man. He is an ex directing professor of psychiatry, CIP Ranchi. I have seen from my childhood, from my young days, how he has developed the continuation of psychiatry. And he's a teacher of teachers. His students are teachers and they have also become teachers of teachers. He pioneered EV study and significant from psychiatry teachers. He is an international authority in many fields of psychiatry. With this, the modest and knowledgeable, eminent, dying of psychiatry, Dr. A. Sat Mizani, I welcome you, sir. And we, we, are with, we have with us Dr. Shamir Prahara from Manipal University. He is a MBBS from Guwahati Medical College, Guwahati. He is DPM and MD from CIT Ranchi. He is a faculty of Kastupa Medical College, Manipal since 2010. Currently, he is Professor and Maturity of Psychiatry. He is a GS, MCM, FAI, MER fellow in 2007. His interest areas are psychopharmacology, brain stimulation, medical education. 
We are publications in peer review journals, book chapters, and chief associate editor of IJPM. He has received the best resident award in 2007, Shamil Garson Young Investigator Award in 2008, and several travel awards, the Shalagoram Distinguished Young Teacher Award. And last but then not the least, he is also from our place. Welcome, Samir. It's a privilege to welcome you. And with this, I hand over the meeting to the chairperson. Your face, please. Thank you. Should I start? Well, you can uh, introduce the speaker and then we can start. Yeah. Please do. Pawan, uh, equals TV. Thank you. Is it visible, sir? Yes. Samir. Doctor. Doctor Samir, introduce if you can introduce Doctor. the speaker. Speaker. Samir, you can see the yeah, yeah. I I can do that. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Um, so welcome to today's uh, meeting. So at the outset, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Tuban Pati, um, uh, Ali Mamrit uh, for getting me here. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to actually uh, co-chair with uh, uh, my teacher, uh, uh, Professor Hak Nizami. So uh, I'll, I'll introduce the speaker. So the speaker for today's uh, program is uh, Professor Subha Chakravarti. Uh, he's Professor of Psychiatry from PGI uh, Chandigarh. Uh, so he's MD, FAMS, FRC Psych. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's basically an adult psychiatrist. His area of interest are mood disorders, bipolar disorder, uh, specifically schizophrenia, uh, family caregiving, licensed psychiatry, ECT, daily psychiatry, treatment adherence, psychosocial treatment. So you can see a very wide, uh, very wide uh, interest areas. A uh, lot of publications, around uh, 375 publications and many research awards uh, to his credit. He has been a member of expert working group on mood and anxiety disorders for the revision of ICD-10 uh, uh, classification system. So welcome you, sir, uh, for your uh, presentation. Uh, sir, I'll share, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Sir. Are these slides visible, sir? Yeah, it is. Uh, Dr. Subha, you'd like to start now? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the kind ch the chairpersons for their introduction. And thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, plan to talk on a very rare disorder that we often don't see, Tourette's syndrome or Tourette's disorder. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, I must say even before beginning that because it's such a rare disorder, we don't often see this and we are, at least I am relatively inexperienced in this field. And I bring my adult psychiatric perspective, as you will probably realize that 
is more of a childhood disorder and generally seen by child and adolescent psychiatrists, but we have seen adult patients and I come from that perspective. Secondly, I, I come, I'm going to deal with it mostly from the perspective of Indian settings because we are <coughs> a limited resource, limited skill settings, particularly in general hospital psychiatric units. And whatever I know about managing Tourette's uh, behaviorally, I have learned <coughs> with the help of my team, which, uh, so I'm just a part of a team which has managed some people with Tourette's, not too many. Uh, so I'll, I beg you to uh, remember my limitations. Uh, and can I have the next slide, please, then? Okay, it all starts with this man with a very long name. Uh, we know him as Gilles de la Touré. And in 1885, despite his long name, he produced a very succinct description of nine patients with a classic triad of motor and vocal tics, coprolalia and echolalia. Next, please. And he was a disciple of this man in the foreground, Jean-Martin uh, Charcot. Uh, Charcot is what uh, uh, IT people would call the ideas man. He gave the idea to um, Gilles de la Touré to describe these cases. Uh, but uh, his generos generosity was uh, um, in his generosity, he did not name the syndrome, but named it as Gilles de la Syndrome, uh, who Gilles de la Tourette being his favorite pupil. Next, please. So what is Tourette disorder? It's a neurodevelopmental disorder. It begins in childhood or at least before adulthood. It's characterized by multiple motor and vocal tics. Ticks are usually defined as sudden, rapid, brief, recurrent, and so on, non-rhythmic, stereotype. They can be motor or vocalizations. Vocal ticks uh, uh, are more commonly called phon phonic ticks. It's a chronic disorder naturally, and it is associated with comorbid psychiatric disorders. Nine, in 90% of the instances, Therefore, it's, although it's a neuropsychiatric disorder, it's not simply a movement disorder. It is also a complex psychiatric disorder. Next, please. Yeah, uh, the key features, I think this might be familiar to many of you. Uh, there is this sort of triad, you could say, of key features. The first one is called a premonitory urge. That's an unpleasant somatosensory urge, something like an itch or an inner tension. Once this urge starts, the tension builds up. And what the person does, especially an older, someone more than 10 years or so, is to stop uh, giving in to the urge. But eventually the urge becomes so strong that they perform the take in order to obtain relief from this unpleasant sensation. Now, there's always been a confusion whether this whole process is voluntary or involuntary. Uh, the closest people have got to is saying that it is voluntary as well as un involuntary, because there is some awareness, but there is some lack of control. People have used the unusual term called involuntary for this. So once they suppress this uh, uh, urge to take, it's only temporary, even though it's voluntary, and it's always followed by a rebound exacerbation of takes. And this whole cycle goes on. It's exacerbated in stress, boredom, or uh, by social interactions, illnesses. And it's actually better during periods of goal-directed activity. So this gives rise to the typical waxing and waning course in which the ticks not only occur in bouts, 
but they change character, severity, distribution, complexity, and frequency over both short and long time periods. Next, please. Next, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, the first part of the, the key features, the pre-monetary urges. As you can see, there's what is known as a rostrocaudal, that is more in the head than now, arms and less in the appendicular. This is the hallmark. No other movement disorder has this premonetary urge. But the difficulty here is although 90% of adolescents, adults will be aware and report this urge, children less, less than 9 and 10 years are neither aware and not report, which creates substantial difficulties when you plan behavior therapy for children. Next, please. This is uh, the, the waxing and waning course. It's called the fractal character of tick occurrence because as you can see, the, it occurs in bouts of seconds, hours, days, weeks, and then there are bouts and bouts of ticks. Uh, this kind of uh, organization only happens in what is known as a, a chaotic system in mathematical models, the theory of chaos. So there is no predictability about ticks. It, it follows what is known as the laws of chaos. Next, please. Uh, okay, what about um, de La Torre's classic card nowadays because of perhaps the extended um, sort of broad definition, these classic features like coprolalia, copropraxia particularly have become much more uncommon, but they're still seen in about one third of the uh, patients in specialist clinics. Echolalia, echopraxia, et cetera, similarly uncommon. But what is common and is often seen is this thing called just right phenomena. When uh, patients perform the trick, they will do the same tick over and over again till they get it right, and that gives them relief. Unless they get it right, they don't get relief. Disturbed sleep is common. Self-destructive behaviors is common. And then there, there is this unusual thing uh, called non-obscene complex behaviors. And these are basically not coprolalia, but uh, uh, sort of disinhibition in which patients end up insulting other people, even though they don't want to. Next, please. So, uh, as I said, uh, sticks uh, are motor, or they are what is known as pho phonic. Uh, some people call them vocal ticks, but uh, not all uh, phonic ticks include the vocal cords, grunting, sniffing, etc. So, the class better description is phonic. And then they can be simple or complex. In the original definition, I had mentioned that ticks are sudden, rapid, etc., brief, but complex ticks are slower, sustained, apparently coordinated, more involved. The person is more involved in uh, performing these ticks. They appear almost semi purposeful and deliberate. So they are slightly different, and some people have criticized the current definitions of uh, TD in uh, antics in uh, DSM because they don't include this part. They don't include uh, definitions of complex ticks. Anyway, the, uh, because it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, the complexity of ticks also increases over time. It starts at six to seven years with simple motor ticks by about two years later, they have simple phonic tricks. Then by the age of 10 to 12 years, when the TD is at maximum security, they de develop complex motor and or phonic and or phonic ticks. Next, please. So uh, this is just, uh, I don't know whether you can see it properly, but this just to show that motor ticks and phonic ticks can be simple, complex, the most frequent motor tick, therefore, is a simple tick like eye blinking, and the most common phonic tick are simple ticks like sif, sniffing, grunting, throat clearing. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. 
Uh, now, this is a classic neurodevelopmental disorder pattern. Uh, that is, the ticks start early, peak uh, at a certain age, uh, start by five to seven years, peak by 10 to 12 years, and then they start to decline in severity right throughout adolescence and come down. Uh, nobody is quite sure why this happens, but the most uh, probable reason is sort of development of frontal lobe circuits. They develop by adolescence and frontal lobe control becomes better. And because frontal lobe deficient control most probably causes uh, ticks, once the frontal lobe circuits mature, spontaneous decline is observed. Next, please. So by uh, adult or early adulthood, only about 20% have severe ticks. Uh, that, uh, but this is only about tick. The quality of life, the functioning of adolescents or early is still impaired compared to normal people without ticks. And partly the reason for their impairment, although their ticks decrease, their psychosocial impairment persists mainly because of their comorbidities. Because by this time they have developed most commonly ADHD or uh, OCD, and that contributes, rather than tick severity, more to the impairment. So even though it might seem as, you know, only five to 10% have problems, it, a lot of them have actually psychosocial impairment. Next, please. So that is it. Uh, now the modern day uh, triad, unlike, um, uh, 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 Gilletilal storage is ticks with comorbidity or TD plus TD with comorbidity. So, if you want to know about, if you want to define a triad of Tourette's in this day and age, it will be motor ticks, vocal ticks, and comorbid conditions. That's the current triad. There's no longer coprolalia, there's no longer coprofexia. And this the two common ones are obsessive compulsive disorder and ADHD, followed closely by mood disorders and dis other uh, disorders as well. To, again, to reiterate, only 10% of people with Tourette's will have pure Tourette's, that is Tourette's without comorbidity, extremely uncommon. Next, please. So this is a recent study in the JAMA psychiatry, and this just shows you what kind of disorders are common. If you take the whole obsessive compulsive spectrum, they're probably slightly more common, but ADHD, ADHD is commoner than o, o, OCD, mood, anxiety, disruptive, et cetera. And as you can see, 86% in this study met the criteria for TD+. Next, please. Yeah, this shows you how the oh, two things perhaps. One is that ADHD actually starts with the ticks or even two years earlier, whereas OCD starts about two years later. So the burden of ticks uh, at a slightly younger age is more due to ticks, then comes hyperkinetic disorder, and then by 10 to 12 years, uh, the burden can be either due to ticks or uh, uh, ADHD or uh, even obsessive compulsive disorder. Comorbidity is more common in males and by 10 to 12 years and in early adulthood adolescent, it simply overshadows the tick disorder. And it's always associated with poorer outcome as, in, as I said, it's the primary reason for persisting impairment and poor quality of life in adolescence or adulthood. Next, please. Now, the question is, why do we not see too many patients of TD? Uh, is TD uncommon in Asia? We have to talk of Asia because there are no epidemiological studies or one, uh, perhaps one, uh, from India. Uh, but as you can see, uh, the meta-analysis reveals that about 0.8, 0.9% 
uh, have TD, that's the prevalence. And these meta-analyses also include Asian studies. And this has uh, led, Mary Robertson is probably the one of the foremost authorities. Uh, she's from the Institute of Psychiatry, I think in the UK. And she has written extensively on this international prevalence and international uh, characteristics of TD. And she asserts that approximately 1% from age four, 5 to 18 years have TD worldwide. Uh, actual studies of Asian prevalence show a little bit less, but that is most probably due to methodological research. Next, please. So not only is TD different in uh, uh, same, the prevalence is same, it's also not different because cross-cultural studies have shown no differences in age of onset, male predominance, tick profiles, comorbidity. Indian literature is slightly scarce, but we have this one case series of uh, 14 patients in 2005 and this uh, newer um, case uh, retrospective report of about, I think, 43 patients. Uh, and again, the age of onset uh, and other features are uh, absolutely like the other uh, reports of TD in other countries. So we can safely conclude that the presentation of TD in India is fairly classic. Next, please. So even if it is, even if the uh, presentation is so characteristic, not just in India but elsewhere as well, there is unfortunately a lag of about eight to ten years, actually, more commonly, in diagnosing TD, diagnosis of TD, and instituting treatment. The biggest single problem, and at least in India, we think, is that there is very poor awareness about this disorder, not just among the family, obviously, but even in professionals, certainly non-psychiatric, but even psychiatric. Other atypical features also make for this lag, but uh, you know what we have experienced is that uh, this is the unawareness is probably the single most defining reason for delay in diagnosis, delay in treatment. Next, please. So we need to uh, pay some attention to the diagnosis, especially when we see someone with TD. And uh, we believe in doing a very, and have been doing a very structured diagnosis in which first the TD is diagnosed by history, examination, and more importantly, observation of movements. I'll come to that in a minute. Then there is, once you've diagnosed TD, you have to rule out other similar conditions. That's done by history, examination, and some amount of investigations. Then you have to, because 90% people have comorbid diagnosis, you have to have a very high index of suspicion for comorbidity, and generally your history, mental state examination will reveal that. Symptom severity, of ticks and comorbid conditions has to be rated. You have to consider individual family environmental factors with which your treatment will not be complete. All this then leads to the behavioral analysis and then you formulate a treatment plan. So uh, once this structured assessment is done, it's very hard to miss TD. Misdiagnosis that is so common uh, is almost uh, uh, often never happens if one follows a structured schedule. Next, please. So this is what I was talking. This is a slightly older, this is not the DSM-4 or 5 criteria, but it is a slightly older criteria. I wish to highlight it because as you can see, for definite TD, they say that motor and or vocal text must be witnessed by a reliable, examiner directly at some point or be recorded by video tape or whatever and once if this is not done then you cannot it will have to call it probable TD. So once you see the movement uh, and you know uh, what a tick is 
then you will almost never miss the diagnosis. That's why, although this is a slightly older classification, I thought I should highlight. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, oh, the, uh, next, 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 please. Next. Yeah, oh, well, there's a list of similar, uh, 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 similarly occurring mimics of ticks, dystonia, chorea, et cetera. I won't go into the details, but it, of course, uh, it needs to be distinguished from this. Sometimes it's useful, as we did in one person, is to go through all the definitions and then decide whether it sticks or whether it's something else. Next, please. Yeah, and then there is a list. I mean, this is a very small list of differential diagnosis. It's just illustrative is how you differentiate it from history. And then uh, you do uh, some investigations which should uh, actually uh, help you uh, you know, rule out these differential diagnoses. Next, please. Yeah, so uh, as I said, you have to rate symptom severity, both of the ticks and uh, of uh, the comorbid conditions. Next, please. The commonest scale used to re rate ticks is the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale. It has two scales for tick severity and impairment. And most importantly, a 25 to 35% reduction in this scale actually tells you that your treatment is working. It indicates a positive response. Next, please. Uh, this shows the, the kind of scales you could use to uh, evaluate or uh, the severity of comorbid. Next, please. Right, so just to before we come to the standard behavioral therapies in vogue now, just wanted to take you through what's gone on in the past. So in 1885, as I uh, as already mentioned, there was the first description. But uh, after that, for about 70 years, TD was considered a, a psychogenic disorder, a psychoanalytic disorder, and a lot of psychoanalytic therapy was done, which uh, was not helpful. And somewhere from 1970s to at least right up to 2000, a lot of other behavioral therapies were tried at the list, as you can see. And uh, none of these are proved to be either effective or certainly not as effective as habit reversal, CB CBIT, and ERP. Uh, the uh, other development that happened that actually helped in uh, sort of forwarding this, pushing these behavioral therapies into the provenance is the realization that TD is a neuropsychiatric disorder when haloperidol started working. And from them, from then onwards, TD rather than a psycho, um, psychological disorder has become uh, a neuropsychiatric, neurodevelopmental disorder. And these uh, um, behavioral therapies are premised on the fact that TD is a neuropsychiatric disorder. First described by Azrin and Nunn in 73, and by now, till right up to the present, one can say that these three treatments, HRT, CBIT, and ERP are standard treatments. Nothing else comes even close. Next slide, please. So to understand uh, these, how these treatment works, we have to go through a few behavioral principles. The first is called negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement basically means that once there is an aver aversive event, an unpleasant event, like the premonitory urges in our patients, they are terminated by a particular response. Patients learn to terminate them by a particular response, in this case, by indulging in ticks. That basically means this cycle starts. Every time that uh, the aversive event uh, occurs, then every time the response occurs. So every time premonitory urges occur, 
the ticks are going to go hand in hand. This cycle is called a negative reinforcement cycle. And these are the two ways negative reinforcement uh, occurs. It can start at the head end. That is, it can try to avoid the aversive stimulus at all. Avoid situations which make the aversive, that is called avo avoidance learning, or it can start at the tail end. That is basically escape by, com escape learning, that is basically escape the uh, premonitory urges by performing ticks. Next, please. Uh, that's just a depiction of negative reinforcement. Next, please. Right, then there are two more principles that uh, come into being, behavioral principles, uh, operant behavioral principles. Uh, first is known as habituation. The ne next is known as extinction. They are basically uh, the same process and the same outcome. That is, once you present one uh, stimulus repeatedly, the response comes down. So if you present premonitory urges repeatedly, the tick indulgence, the response comes down. Uh, the only thing is they explain it by slightly different mechanism. Habituation is a theory proposed by Edna Fova for OCD mainly, and she contends that there are some sort of fear structures in our brain. And when you present information during the BT, incompatible with the fear structure, it uh, results in habituation. Whereas extinction is a, is a form of inhibitory learning. It is dependent on an MDA. And class, currently, it is the accepted way that sort of the response wanes or the ticks come down. Next, please. So this is just to show how habituation and extinction occurs not just in HRT and uh, CBIT, it also occurs in ERP, that repeated exposure brings down the ticks. Next, please. So uh, just, a, I mean, this thing was about uh, behavior therapy, so I will dwell on these uh, uh, treatments a bit. First of all, components of habit reversal tre treatment. Uh, there are three main components, awareness training, com competing response, and social support. These are the operative components. If, you are, if your HRT includes the first three, it's more likely to be useful. But in its classic descriptions, Azrin and Nun did include other components, and we'll see how they are shared with other effective therapies. So next slide, please. Yeah, awareness training basically consists of four parts. You train the uh, patient to detect the tick, building awareness of occurrence. Then you also ask them to describe response description. Then slowly this process, uh, once they learn this process, you start to ask them to detect it at the earliest, even to detect premonitory urges. And then they also are made aware of the situations like the external or internal situations that exacerbates their ticks. So classically awareness training consists of detection, description, early warning, and situational awareness. Next, please. Okay, competing response as defined by Azrin and Nunn is a response that is opposite to the tick movement. So it basically strengthens the antagonistic muscles that are incompatible with the tick. It should be socially inconspicuous so that the person can perform it socially and also compatible with normal activities. And the important thing is once the competing response is taught, what they are taught, what the, the patients are taught is to hold on to the competing response for several minutes. Some say one, some say three, but basically till the premonitory urge passes. Later, it has been shown that it need not be agonist, antagonist contraction. For example, for deep, for all phonic or vocal tics, we suggest deep breathing or even abdominal tics. I saw a patient today uh, who I'm following up with TD, uh, 
uh, and he has abdominal tic. So I asked him, how does that go? And he says, yeah, uh, deep breathing helps. So it need not be. There are some times when you cannot uh, uh, sort of uh, involve antagonists. It's not practically possible, for example, for phonic tics. So it's not necessary. Next, please. Uh, this is from Azrin and Nan. They show them how to, you know, uh, competing responses for uh, motor tics, uh, contraction of agar, antagonist muscles. Next, please. So the third part is having social support, an unusual definition of the term, but there is supposed to be a social support person, which is usually the caregiver. And what does the social support person do? They help the patient in the whole process, basically, from awareness training to competing response and situation awareness, and they help by, uh, you know, at praising the person, developmentally appropriate means that depending upon their age, they pr praise the person when they correctly implement all the steps. As simple as that. Next, please. Right. So, as I said, uh, when Azrin first uh, uh, proposed his uh, uh, HRT, he had other things. One was to improve motivation. He suggested this constant reviewing of uh, the whole process called habit inconvenience review, whatever is inconveniencing the learning. Uh, and then public performance of tics was suggested. Generalize, for generalization training, that is the uh, generalization of the efficacy to other situations, uh, he suggested something called symbolic rehearsal in which the uh, patient is asked to imagine how uh, real life situations in which ticks occur and then uh, enforce control. Relaxation training was very much a part of HRT. And generally these are done by in one hour sessions for each tick. If there is more than one tick, we establish a hierarchy. And uh, some, unlike the ascending hierarchy of OCD, I think what is recommended is you start with the most troublesome tick or the most troublesome symptom. Next, please. So uh, this is a latter day version of HRT called CBIT, Comprehensive Behavioral Intervention for ticks. As you can see, it includes the first three components of habit reversal. Beyond that, and also relaxation, which is, as I said, even Azirin had talked about. Uh, but they are, it's unique in sort of um, paying more attention to this function-based treatment, which includes function-based assessment and function-based intervention, right? Uh, next, please. I'll just explain these two terms a little more. Next, please. So, uh, ticks, as we have already noted, increase in certain circumstances. These could be and result in certain consequences. So the antecedents and consequences of ticks are always there. And these could be either internal antecedents like, you know, uh, negative anxiety states or negative mood states, or it could be external things, somebody, uh, you know, in school or something. And similarly, consequences can be internal, shame, guilt, or even external avoidance of school. So what function-based assessment do is to interview the patient and the family and also ask them to monitor these antecedent consequences to arrive at a comprehensive plan for what is going on. And then interventions are directed. For example, if antecedent uh, uh, is a, a negative internal state, you know, teaching relaxation or reassuring them will be an antecedent intervention, antecedent internal intervention. And a consequence intervention could be something like, you know, uh, going to the school and explaining to the teacher that would be a consequence external intervention. So they do that so that the ticks generalize and are uh, in real life situation control is obtained. Next, please. So ERP is very much like uh, the ERP or exposure or response prevention, and it comes from OCD. 
So it basically con consists of exposure to pre-monetary urges and response prevention of ticks. And it has a high ascending hierarchy and systematically suppressing the ticks is part of it. The classic uh, studies have used two training sessions followed by usually 10 ERP sessions for each tick. And nowadays, one hour sessions are quite sufficient of ERP. Next, please. Right, uh, we cannot forget other strategies that are sort of part of behavioral therapy. Uh, this is an important, very important, perhaps the crucial part. In any behavior therapy, motivation is very important. If the patient is not motivated, there is no behavior therapy. However skilled, however resourceful you are. So motivating the patient is very important and education is the first part in that process. And education is not just about the disorder, it is also telling them, explaining them in detail about the behavioral treatment. And as you can see, this systematic so uh, review showed what we already do that unless the education is certain only a sufficiently detailed program will result in improved knowledge attitudes behaviors and engagement most importantly adherence and just saying you have td and not providing anything more will never do that it will basically fail or even make the patients more uh, uh, uncomfortable. Next, please. Uh, this is just a list uh, of all the things. It's just to show that how many things you need to talk about. We do not start HRT or CBIT or ERP in any, or any um, behavior therapy in any disorder unless we are absolutely sure that we have the patient and the family with us, that they have understood as best as they can, what we are going to do, they have actually agreed and they are motivated. Because if we don't do that, it more often than not fails. Next, please. So not only education, you have to have support. And both education and support are not one-off phenomena. They are ongoing. And uh, importantly, you have to support not only the individual, but you have to support the family, the family caregiver. And you have to not only support, these are the areas that are very common, stigma, emotional practical consequences, caregiver burden, and not only you know, help them with this, but eventually improve motivation, self-esteem, very important, Resilience functioning, that also is your goals of your supportive treatment. And uh, where they, uh, these are available, you can take the help of what are known as advocacy organizations, care organizations or NGOs. And so advocacy is a big part of support. One of this is to make the patient a self-advocate, an advocate for not to worry about his illness, not to feel ashamed but professional advocacy, organizational advocacy is also important. Next, please. So, uh, as I said, from 1990s to the present, people have uh, done a lot of research on this, and now, by now, there is a relatively large evidence base on these three principal modes of treatment, HRT, CBIT, and ERP. There are numerous, more than 50 by last count, uh, narrative reviews, systematic reviews, about six or seven meta-analyses. There are guidelines all over the place, very large RCTs, particularly for CBIT, and secondary analyses of the So a varied, a large and a varied evidence base. HTRT, because it started early, the largest number of trials are for HRT. CBIT, the good trials have been conducted somewhere around 2010. And so there are fewer trials, but they are more large scale and more methodologically sound. ERP, unfortunately, there are very few trials. So HRT is significantly better proved to be than uh, placebo controls or weightless controls. 
but when it comes to other active treatment it does not perform as well cbit on the other uh, hand outscores active treatments like supportive psychotherapy problem solving all the other things that have not proved effective erp in one study showed similar efficacy to hrt and then because these meta analyses are done we have a sort of um, idea of the magnitude of their effect and uh, in all studies the effects are 0.6 medium effect sizes point meta analysis 0.6 to 0.8 but for psychiatric treatment these are very good because rarely do psychiatric treatments have an effect size of 0.8 or more right and then the numbers needed to treat uh, are about 3 if you know the index anything below 5 is considered a very efficacious treatment uh, acute treatment that is and therefore 3 is a very good number so that shows you your efficacy the other thing is about response rates uh, hrt because there is a lot of small rcts and case studies you know initially 100% response rate was reported but with more uh, sort of large scale studies uh, one can uh, the response rate is that about 50% of the people respond and they have about a 50% reduction in ticks that is the general response rate more importantly now there are studies which are showing that uh, hrt does uh, and cbrt and also erp not only have reduces tick severity but has effects on outcomes such as anxiety behavioral problems functioning quality of life and more importantly even ocd and adhd symptoms so it's not only useful in reducing ticks but also symptoms and then the other uh, part of treatment of td is um, um, behavioral medication there are basically two classes i mean there's a lot about medications i won't go into that's not my focus but basically there are two types of medications the alpha 2 adrenergic agonist clonidine guanfacin and antipsychotics which consist of second generation uh, aripiprazole risperidone or first generation haloperidol pimozide the funny part is that antipsychotics wherever they have been compared with clonidine and other they have turned out to be more efficacious there is no doubt about that effect sizes etc but because they carry so much risk and because this is a disorder of children and adolescents there is a lot of concern about risks of antipsychotic side effect therefore almost every guideline will say start with uh, clonidine first and then if clonidine does not work go on to antipsychotics and among antipsychotics arep Uh, piprazole is approved by the FDA, whereas risperidone has been considered the antipsychotic of choice uh, by the European guidelines. As far as behavior therapy is concerned, there is insufficient evidence to show which is more effective. No head-to-head -head trials, but in these meta-analyses, when they have compared effect sizes, HRT, CBIT, particularly. the effect size is equal to that of antipsychotic and most importantly greater than alpha 2 uh, adrenergic anger so they are as good as antipsychotics and even better than clonidine if done properly next please uh so uh, but bt obviously medications probably to pop a pill is almost is much easier even for kids right uh, bt has lack of side effects it might be preferred by some users and it's possibly the most comprehensive treatment of ticks but the main problem with bt is this awareness it hinges on awareness of premonitory urges and if uh, the child usually below 9 years it does not have does not have that awareness then uh, nobody is quite sure what to do perhaps medications perhaps a simpler form of psychosocial 
intervention. Then any BT, any psychotherapy requires a lot of motivation, introspection, and as I said, that's a key step. And finally, you may, uh, even in the West, access to skilled BT therapists, people trained in HRT or TBIT is uh, limited. So, but medications are not the answer either, and they can only you be used to attenuate ticks or improve fun functioning in the short term. And for even for this, they should be prescribed in monotherapy in combinations with BT and drug holidays. That represents good practices. Next, please. So that brings us to this tired approach or the stepwise approach to treatment, which is uh, propagated everywhere, that in transient and mild takes, apart from education and supportive treatment, nothing else is required. For moderately severe takes, HRT, uh, behavioral therapy might just be enough, right? But in severe takes, and particularly those with comorbidities, you start, it is recommended that you start with behavioral therapy, but simultaneously or at least consequently you should be adding medication because most likely that only hrt will not only uh, hrt cvit rp will not work if the ticks are severe and comorbidities are there and for refractory td uh, right now what is being suggested is dbs but again that that that's a slightly controversial treatment next please uh, again, in this part of this tired, uh, this sort of stepwise approach, it is important to re remember that not all ticks need to be treated, you know, uh, intensively, that is. So only when they cause ticks, cause or symptoms, cause subjective discomfort, social impairment, emotional problems, functional impairment, do you enter into intensive treatment. And that treatment has naturally to be individualized. And as I said, unlike other disorders, here it is recommended that you usually start with the most troublesome symptom in terms of both severity and impairment. Next, please. So even after all that, even after his efficacy, even after what uh, is fair, are fairly simple and fairly well, publicized uh, sort of uh, protocols for these treatments, there are a lot of problems in implementing them. These problems are there in the West where they have more resources. And as we have, uh, we believe that obviously this, uh, these are uh, much more, should be much more common in our uh, settings where resources are limited or skills are limited. But our endeavor has to has been to show that we can implement behavioral therapy if we followed a structural uh, protocol, even in general hospital psychiatric units, let, which are certainly not specialized, certainly don't have this you know skilled personnel, and certainly not the real resource. And we have done that. We have published a small paper with the first seven patients that we have treated with BT. So otherwise, lack of awareness, which you have talked about, there is lack of discernment, even in the West, uh, access availability. Even, despite all this evidence, there are methodological problems, not, uh, therapeutic response, 50%, only 50% showing 50% response is not that good. There is a greater need, which is already started to address more sort of real life out outcomes. And then people who know about BT can have um, concerns like symptoms, a new tick appears or symptoms worsen or they have rebound symptoms or patients uh, will be too focused on that and not study or, and then it will go back to the psychoanalyst. That's the ma major fear. It will go back to the hand of the psychiatrist. Nobody likes that. Not certainly not patients and their family. But these are all unfounded. I'll not go into detail, but there is almost every part of these concerns have been subjected to analysis and all this substitution, excess servation, rebound, et cetera, are, are not common with BT. Next, please. 
So, uh, be, but because of these problems, people are trying newer and newer methods, for example, online treatments, combination of treatments, HRT, or group-based techniques seems to uh, do better than individual techniques in some cases. And uh, this is a new, uh, it's not a new technique, adding D cycloserine that basically uh, enhances inhibitory learning. It has been used in OCD, phobias, et cetera, with uh, moderate to no success, but now they are using it in ticks. This is the first study that has appeared. Okay, next, please. So that's it. Uh, as you can see, Oliver Sacks, you've heard of, and uh, he says it's a disorder of strange motions and notions and animation and most complex and involves every aspect of emotional. So that is something to understand when you see a patient, when you attempt, uh, it couldn't have been said more beautifully. Thank you. Um, thank you, sir, uh, for that uh, uh, comprehensive presentation. I think uh, starting from uh, historical aspects to clinical features, to diagnosis, to um, evaluation, assessment, to therapy, and uh, beautifully presented, uh, and uh, specifically not focusing on the, the old uh, uh, therapies which are outdated, but focusing more on the, the current uh, evidence-based therapies, uh, beautifully explaining the, all the steps of uh, habit reversal training uh, to other uh, competitive uh, therapies. So very lucid presentation, I would say. Um, I, I think there are already a lot of questions in the chat box. Uh, I think some of them were answered actually during the presentation itself, but then some other things can be taken up. Uh, during the discussion. Uh, before I hand over uh, for the for the questions, I uh, would request uh, Haksa to uh, give his comments. Uh, Haksa, you have to unmute yourself and uh, we are waiting for you. Good evening. Uh, this has been a very educative experience. A very nicely done seminar, I would say. And uh, I think what we have to remember, you know, doing these kind of programs, that uh, there is something innate about mental health. It has to be a teamwork. There has to be a psychiatrist. There has to be clinical psychologist. There has to be psychiatric social work and psychiatric nurse. Unfortunately, this kind of you know, resources are available in very, very few centers in the country. And when you come across a psychiatrist talking about behavioral management of some uncommon condition like Tourette, that is a rewarding experience. I think, uh, you know, my, Coming to Tourette as such, apart from some of the, you know, common comorbidities like OCD or ADHD, in clinical practice, something more bizarre happens. These are the cases where they can be, you know, fairly common, I would say, uh, learning disabilities associated in these children. Then behavioral disorders, fairly bizarre, you know, like uh, they might be dropping their own close relations. Sexual disinhibition is really painful to the family, how to put up with it. And, you know, the behavioral techniques described usually in the textbooks, you know, a clinical psychologist has to go much, much beyond that. And uh, another thing is that the kind of cases which do come to clinical attention, whether it is a hospital or in our private practice, they are the kind of cases who are having serious problems. So obviously they are not only HRT, not only CBIT, not only ERP, 
much beyond that involving the family and various other issues are required so i would say on the whole this is you know a very interesting presentation and the clinical approach has to be apart from medication there has to be a behavioral intervention there has to be a clinical psychology intervention uh, wherever it is available thank you thank you sir thank you so much so uh, like dr subhas told that he has been busy he has been more of an adult psychiatrist so i would start my question from the very fact that sir how common are adult onset uh, tics and are the interventions in adult onset tics similar to you know young onset or maybe maybe 10 year old 14 11 year old child having onset of tics sir unmute yourself sir sir you are muted can you hear me uh um if you go by uh, the clinical studies uh, about uh, 15% 85% of these tics develop uh, uh, by 10 years of age in the west so uh, anything above 16 uh, or 18 only about 15% will have their first onset in our patients the problem is we see them at a later age because it's not picked up and uh, minor tics like eye blinking etc are mixed are missed initially by the family and even by professionals so we come to a sort of false later age of onset usually but when you inquire you find most of them have childhood onset so uh, very uncommon uh, adult uh, anything beyond 16 or 10 even one would say uh, uh, and it's not very they were not at all studied adult onset but whatever little is there suggests that the profile is not very different and of course behavior therapy is much easier to conduct in adolescents and adults because they understand the whole thing they have the capacity for that plus most importantly premonot they are more aware of their premonitory urges that below a very young child probably will not be at you know i haven't uh, treated a child uh, with td with behavior therapy so uh, i don't know what they do i'm glad i'm not a child psychiatrist okay well uh, yeah thank you sir uh, someone has asked a question role of etns that is external uh, trigeminal nerve stimulation is there any is role, role in of, sorry uh, external trigeminal nerve stimulation i haven't I run across it. this uh, there are a lot of exotic treatments on the the thing but uh, if you look at it uh, the latest sort of evidence then after cbit or hrt which is more or less cbit uh comes uh, drugs and after drugs comes dbs dbs that too there is some controversy about where globus pallidus or thalamus etc but it's now being recognized as a reasonable option for very refractory tick other i, I uh, i'm not aware rtms for example has been used there are other uh, treatment but none of them uh, not even rtms for that matter is efficacious so we need not uh, you know bother ourselves with that even dbs i i think it would take a brave person to do it okay uh, it, it's not that yeah as far as i could gather uh, most of the thing in bt hinges around the pre monetary urge as you said exactly so so if the pre monetary urge a person is we are not able to uh, tune in or uh, point out then what happens bt is not used to yeah, that well person. that uh, as as i said that will happen in young children who are not aware and uh, nobody is quite sure uh, some people insist that you can still do bt i guess you can do a different form of bt for example erp can be done without even pre monetary 
because it's a very simple treatment. You just expose them to the situations in which they develop ticks and you respond to prevent the ticks. That can be done if the patient is agreeable, motivated. Some amount of HRT can be done. You can still train them competing response. You Maybe not the AT, the awareness training, but you can do the competing response. You can do the relaxation. You can do the function-based assessment. Still can be done, even without awareness. So I guess an abbreviated, simpler form will probably uh, be possible, but I can tell you that nobody's tried it out. So we don't know. Unless they conduct a trial of uh, modifying this, uh, I don't know. There, there are not simply not enough patients. I think there are not enough adult patients for them to bother their heads up. And as I said, in adults, 90% will have awareness. That's not a bad figure to start out with. Sir, sir, can somebody has asked, can coprolalia or coprapraxia occur in isolation rather than as part of the syndrome? If yes, how do we differentiate it from OCD? Conceptualizing the premonitory phase as the obsessive impulse and the mm. vocalization as the compulsive motor act. Mm. Also, is there any role of SSRIs in the treatment of tick disorder? And another question with related to coprolalia is how can a competing response as part of HRT for coprolalia type of ticks be advised? So, Okay, if I can remember all those four or uh, five ones. First one is can coprolalia occur uh, outside TD? Certainly, I think it can. It's simply a frontal lobe disturbance, right? Coprolalia, it's a very complex form of classically associated with TD. But I can imagine we have seen other people have something similar to coprolalia. So it can occur. I, I, I don't know how it, which disorder, I can't tell you, but I, I feel it can occur. Uh, what was the next one? My short term memory is not that good. Sir, how do we differentiate it from OCD? Yeah, a very good question. I have not gone into because that was not the part. But you see, at one level, it is like OCD. People say that the premonitory urge is the obsession and the tick is the compulsion. You can make out the similarity, but that's where it ends, right? OCD is a very complex, both ways. The obsession is very complex, the content is very complex, and the uh, compulsion, the ritual is very complex. You know, you do, uh, they wash hands, Sometimes you know uh, thirty, and sometimes the rituals are extremely complex. And we, uh, uh, one of our patients, we thought we had OCD, and we tried to inquire from him, "Ki kya hai? Why do you?" He kept touching. He had these uh, ticks of touching everything, touch hundred times a day, touch the road door, touch this, touch that. So we thought it was some sort of magical thinking that he was having and touching was a sort of uh, undoing kind of behavior. So we asked him, why do you touch? And uh, despite uh, getting on his, sitting on his head almost, he couldn't tell us why. He couldn't say, he said, I just need to touch. I don't know. There was no magical thinking. There was no obsessional content, nothing. Then we knew this is not OCD. So uh, if you see OCD, I mean, there, I, I can. I have a lot of slides to differentiate. We have seen, in fact, OCD is the commonest comorbidity we have faced. Uh, but let me just tell you, when you see OCD, because the content is very important. The content of the uh, obsession is very clearly, uh, almost always described. And the, uh, the compulsion is always clearly described. In ticks, it's just, I have this urge, I have to do this. I don't know anything more. That's what they will say. Uh, uh, next question is, all, is there any role of SSRIs in the treatment of tick uh, Not that I know of, not been used. Antipsychotics uh, have been used, but not effective. Or should I should put it that way? Only antipsychotics and clonidase. Last question, something. But, and, and just let me add, uh, SSRIs, uh, tetrabenazine and botulinum toxin. These have been mentioned in the chat box. 
uh, any role of these? Yeah, these VMAT inhibitors are being mentioned now. Uh, nobody is quite sure how, uh, I mean, the latest uh, guidelines uh, say that there is some confidence, moderate to low confidence. Maybe they'll come in more uh, in, in, in the future. Certainly now they are an alternative going by the evidence. Tetrabenazine and others, valbenazine and eutrobenazine or whatever. They have been mentioned. Uh, sir, sup yeah, yep. yeah. Sir, suppose uh, I am sitting in my general OPD. It is not a special OPD, general mm -hmm. psychiatry OPD. So, mm. uh, what is the likelihood that I am uh, going to see presenting alone? Any data or any on any, what, any gender uh, what is the likelihood and that you see someone with comorbidities? Sorry, you are uh, asking what is the likelihood sitting in a general OPD psychiatry? General OPD. Uh, will uh, you see a person TD? with TD? Will yeah. you see a person with TD with or without comorbidities? That's what you are asking? Uh, yeah, TD alone and TD with comorbidities. So what is TD the alone balance you will there? probably never see because they are only 10% of the whole picture. TD with comorbidity, you will probably see. If you take, uh, if you believe Mary Robertson, there are 1% children and adolescents in that uh, beyond your OPD premises who have TD. Uh, will you see them? Yes, you will. I have seen enough, I guess. Uh, you just need to keep your eyes and ears open. Unfortunately, uh, there's only, as I said, there's one prevalence study from India, community prevalence, and that was a bit weird. They, their intakes, they said, is 0.1%, uh, uh, which can't be true. Let me also say, TD is the extreme manifestation of a tick disorder. In um, DSM-5 or any classification, there is a transient tick disorder. There is, um, uh, you know, uh, chronic motor or, or vocal. When they occur together, it's called TD. But they can have chronic motor tick disorder, chronic vocal tick disorder. That's another disorder. And then there are these indeterminate tick disorders. The transient tick disorder, the prevalence among children and adolescents is 20 percent. So you are more likely to see a transient tick disorder. You are also more likely to see people with OCD. You know, one, you know, one third of OCD is OCD with ticks or family history of ticks. So these are common. I can't say how common. Um, not very obviously, but there you are. About 0.5 to 1 percent uh, prevalence is there. That is undisputed. And most commonly with OC and OC spectrum. Yeah, OC or ADHD. Okay. OC or ADHD, uh, actually so sometimes both. More than one okay. comorbidity is also very common. So sometimes okay. you can, so in order of their uh, sort of prevalence, I think ADHD will come first, pure OCD, not spectrum will come second, all kinds of mood and anxiety disorders. And then followed by impulse control, personality problems, other behavioral problems, even schizophrenia. We've seen one guy with schizophrenia. So, so then the three behavior techniques, the HRT, CBIT, and ERP. So, ye kaise change ho jayenge, jaise jaise comorbidities aati hain. So, so, is there any modification in these techniques? How do we adapt uh, to the with to go with the comorbidities? नहीं चेंज करने की कोई जरूरत नहीं है एक चीज है कि सीबीआईटी और एचआरटी आपने देखा ही होगा कि ऑलमोस्ट सेम है कोई इतनी खास डिफरेंस नहीं आ, तो आपको चेंज अपना बेसिक टेक्निक फॉर द टेक नहीं चेंज करना पड़ता क्वेश्चन इज ओनली कि आप एचआरटी सीबीआईटी यूज करेंगे या ईआरपी करेंगे उसमें क्लैरिटी है नहीं but कुछ लोग कहते हैं the European guidelines say कि बड़ा severe end and many takes ERP is a better treatment इतना ही है उससे ज़्यादा नहीं but you don't change you use either of these three and the first two are almost the same बाकी आपको OCD के लिए अपना ERP करना पड़ा that has to be done separate 
from let's say a SOCD separate from the uh, ERP or the CBIT or HRD, whatever you're doing for the tax. We have done it. We have done it. We had actually missed his OCD, a very strange presentation because he had OC thought and then his ticks were his sort of uh, weight. It was almost being used as a compulsion. So we missed. But what is it? We have separate. When we have OCD encounter, we have done OCD. Ke liye, अलग ईआरपी करते हैं ऑब्सेशनल सिम्टम के लिए दैट हैज टू बी डन सिमिलरली फॉर एडीएचडी यू हैव टू डू ऑल द बिहेवियरल ट्रीटमेंट्स जो आपका क्लासरूम है पेरेंटल बेस्ड है कॉग्निटिव बेस्ड है वो करना पड़ता है वो अपने आप नहीं जाते थोड़ा बहुत फायदा होगा दे सम सेकेंडरी इफेक्ट जो अभी दिखा रहे हैं वो ट्रायल्स में बट टू एक्चुअली एड्रेस इट Either with drugs, for example, clonidine is very helpful in TD plus ADHD. An SSRI will be used in TD plus OCD. So drugs be hai. basically you have separately karna padega. You can't just do your uh, BTC, BRT or whatever and sit back and say, bhi theek ho thi. it doesn't happen. And let, let me again emphasize, in the end, at an age beyond 12 years, by the time you see the guy, he is he and his family are more bothered about the comorbidity than the ticks. So there is no question uh, ki the ticks have to, uh, the comorbidity has to be addressed. An equal amount of effort is often required. Thank you, sir. Sir, there's a question. Like uh, you have already told, but maybe they wanted it more in a clearer manner. How should we select the type of therapy techniques for a particular patient? As some of the techniques are mutually exclusive, usually with very young children, training them in competing responses seem to be easier compared to ERP or CBIT. What would you suggest, sir? Yeah, well, uh, the only sort of distinction, as I said, is between HRT, uh, you know, stroke. CBIT, as you can see, the components are same. If you just add function-based uh, assessment, which is a, another name for what Azrin called generalization, you have it and have it motivation. It's HRT in a new name. Uh, but they are promoting it because the Twitch Association of uh, uh, the US of good old USA is uh, interested in it. It's just a new name for HRT. So the distinction is between HRT or CBIT and ERP. ERP is a totally different kind of treatment. Uh, nobody knows how to do it. Uh, what we did in one patient where we used ERP is when we ran across very concrete antecedents. Our OCD experience here कि जब तक ABC मॉडल में A नहीं मिलता है, एंटीसिडेंट नहीं मिलता है, यू कैन फाइंड रिलायबल ट्रिगर्स तब कोई भी ERP होता नहीं है। तो ERP के लिए वो एंटीसिडेंट बहुत जरूरी है। That is very important. If that is there, you can do ERP. If that is not there, which often happens, people will say, I don't know, it's all all the time. So then you cannot. That I would say is the difference. And the other one, as I said, if it's more severe, many, many ticks, then probably ERP. That, I can give you only these two sort of guidelines to go for. What could be the completing response for corporal area? We've never faced any it. Examples. Uh, yeah. All vocal ticks, as I said, or phonic ticks, Diaphragmatic breathing or deep breathing is recommended universally in all protocol. So uh, we recommend for all grunting, sniffing. Coprolilia we have seen. So deep breathing, that's what we recommend. There is nothing else. Mm -hmm. Sir, are there any school based uh, interventions in managing 2A syndrome? Yeah, all these CBIT and for young children in uh, uh, in the West, school-based programs or interventions are a huge thing. They always coordinate the treatment, the psychiatric establishment 
always coordinates with the school. And this is not just for TD. Uh, child psychiatry in the West uh, has a constant coordination with education. For example, uh, take ADHD in UK, for example. You know, uh, they don't believe much in drugs in UK, but they do believe they have this, if a person certifies that this guy has ADHD, the education board will provide a separate teacher, helper, etc. So it's, it's a channel that is open and is established and it's legal for all sorts of learning, neurodevelopmental disabilities in the West. The, uh, the, the role of actually the psychologist uh, is just to certify and then they are more or less taken over by the education, their learning is taken over by the education board, and if they experience, and within those, they have trained counselors who will deal with the behavioral problem. If they need some help, they'll ask you. Most of the time, no. So, it's a done thing, basically, in the West. So, there is a question. Uh, can HRD lead to rebound effect and symptom substitution and how to deal with that? I, I, I said that uh, uh, that has been looked into, that has been a concern. Uh, and uh, there has been secondary reanalysis of these large trials, the CBIT trials, very large, 126, more than 100 uh, children and adolescents. And there has been no evidence of either rebound phenomena or uh, uh, this thing, um, or symptom substitution. You must know that uh, ticks change over the course of time. So that's not actually symptom substitution. Uh, so that can happen, but nothing because of the HRT or CBIT. Even in ERP, there is a greater concern if you tell them to suppress their ticks. Uh, what happens is they'll do it outside, but it doesn't happen if it's done systematically. So rebound is more or less un unknown with systematic application of behavioral techniques and symptom substitution is not a huge problem. Uh, how different are dystonic and clonic tics from simple motor tics, phenomenon-wise? Yeah, dystonic tics are like dystonia. I didn't go into that dystonic tic, sensory tics. would have got too complicated. Dystonic tics are very slow, sustained, just like dystonic movement. They are motor tics. They involve some part of the muscles, but unlike brief, rapid, rhythmic, uh, rhythmic uh, uh, motor tics, simple motor tics, they are long contractions, slow contractions. But they are not coordinated like complex tics. And, and in continuation, sir, how do you differentiate, again, another question, tic disorder from OCD, pure compulsions? Uh, uh, same, uh, uh, the content, I mean, if the person is can tell you a typical obsession, let's just say he has a, you know, uh, doubt about uh, um, contamination, then they will tell you, ki mere mein ye bar bar dimag mein vichar rata hai, ye haath gande ho gaye, rokne ki koshish karte ho, nahi hota hai. That content has to come. And the compulsion. The compulsion will start with simple hand washing, excessive, and in many patients, it will become ritualized. That doesn't happen in TD. Never will the patient be able to tell you why is he in Ildanje, except I have this uneasiness, therefore I take. That's all. That's all they can tell you. They can't tell you why. Does it bring relief? Yes, but they can't particularly tell you about the content of their um, premonitory urge or if anything is going on apart from that, most probably nothing. They are just, it's like it a, a, an itch or a sneeze, sneeze. A premonitory urge is something like an itch or a sneeze or, or the tendency that you, the itching that you feel in your nose while you sneeze. Now, do we really think absurd we don't think right we just try to not to sneeze depending on where we are or not to scratch depending upon 
And when we can't resist to eat scratch, we sneeze. Sometimes we sneeze with abandon, uh, which is very dangerous in these times, but that's it. That's how it has been equated. It's like a urge to itch. Patients have told their doctors, yeah, yeah. Like you're sitting in a church and you get this urge to, uh, you know, clear your throat or sneeze. And that's all. Then you have to do it. It just, you try to stop it, it becomes worse and worse, and then you have to do it. Cognition, the cognitive element content joy, obsession may, that never comes. And that's been our experience. In, uh, it doesn't, unless of course they have, when they have OCD, they have that. They will tell you about their obsession. Like this guy I, I saw weeks ago, he has this that if he breathes in, he imbibes germs. And therefore, he becomes very anxious the moment he breathes. And uh, he tries to get rid of the thought, can't. And uh, then he uh, so anxious that he starts ticking. This is what happens. So we are treating his OCD. There you can see the content. It's clear content. But for a stick, see, it doesn't say. Either they occur because of the OC symptoms, or they even occur on their own when he has premonitory urges. So so he, there is a comment. It's a complicated, comment. Hai, but I didn't want yeah. to go into it. It'll take too much time to explain the differences. But basic difference here. The practical difference is here. Okay, so there was a comment. Some patients who are musically gifted have a longer control on sticks slash trichotillomania while singing. So, any comments on this? this, this I, 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 I couldn't quite get that. Uh, could you repeat uh, it? Someone who is musically gifted who likes to sing and while he is singing, there is more control on sick trichotillomania while, while singing or someone is engaged in a very uh, pleasant mm. activity that... The, yeah. Pleasant so, goal directed. Mm. Comment on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very common observation. There is this book by Oliver Sacks, which is a compilation. Sorry, uh, Oliver stated uh, in all these exotic neuropsychiatric conditions, they tell him about life, he said. Uh, so he, there is this book where he is... Uh, uh, mm, compiled a lot of these brain disorders, etc., agnosia and all that. The first chapter in this book is about TD. It's about a surgeon who has TD and is completely sort of symptomatic. Has not His uh, treatment has not worked so well. So he's t uh, and he operates. He does complex whatever a general surgeon operates, he does operations day in and day out. Not only does he operate, he is situated in a very rural area. He flies, he's got a pilot's license. He flies the plane, reaches the town where the hospital is, goes into the OT, operates, comes out, flies his plane back to his rural household, comes back and then the tick starts. He says, when I operate, when I fly my plane, Plane, no ticks. So that is well known that is also utilized in therapy to uh, ask patients to do these activities. Naturally, you will do it if it's such a strong influence. Sir, what's the role of uh, tetrabenazine and sodium valproate? Tetrabenazine, I say that some uh, reviews are now mentioning that they are useful. Your VMAT inhibitors kate. Um, uh, that is, but uh, it's not still uh, con confidently recommended. Uh, Valproate, uh, no, it's not. Uh, Sir, so, uh, I have a uh, child, I, I've been treating for ticks, only motor ticks. Sir. No behavioral issues, no comorbidities, mm -hmm. topper of the school, he just passed out. So he's been under treatment for the last five years, low dose respiridone, working wonderfully well in him. But then, how long can we should we continue this medication? So the, the parents always ask me. The father is a big police officer here. Brilliant. Uh, unfortunately, no guidelines. The only guidelines we could find was actually from the American Academy of um, uh, 
uh, child and adolescent psychiatry, a 213 guideline, in which they say, as far as drugs are concerned, you should be using them only for one to two years, and then try without drugs, medication, right? For behavior therapy for the particularly bad patients, lifelong. What happens as is happening with our patients is you do this intensive three month HRT, CBIT, ARP. We bring their our response remission. Luckily, I mean that's because we just treated a few patients. Our response rates have been very high, 75 percent or so. Then we send them back home. And then this is a lifelong illness. I saw someone with TD, as I said, today. We've been seeing this guy for seven years. He's there, he has, every time he has a problem, he becomes anxious and then he develops ticks. And then he focuses on the ticks, hi, kya ho gaya kind. So to teach him that this is your part of your life and it's not dangerous and not going to, nothing else is going to happen. You're not going to die of ticks. It's still a task. So you have to cause lifelong engagement. This is a disorder. Uh, if you are lucky, it will go away. Uh, TD I'm talking about. Chronic motor tics, uh, transient tics, you expect them to go away with little treatment. So that's what I can tell you. One to two, uh, you should be trying with after talking with the patients. You should be, perhaps should be trying to withdraw the risperidone and see how it does. If he relapses, obviously go in for another course. Uh, but if he doesn't, that's it. Um, and uh, general advice, support will help to, for him to try over any minor. Uh, it's a lifelong, uh, anything. Psychiatry, you cannot leave your patients. Just, it's not <laughs> bam, bam yeah. kind of treatment. Right? That's not treatment. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you so much, sir. There, there have been many uh, congratulatory messages and uh, people have demanded that you be back on this forum sometime again. So, okay. <laughs> so, so um, Alim, let us, Alim, let us, let us invite Dr. Haq and Dr. Sami to give the closing remarks and Dr. Tufan, ah. sir, will speak. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Sami, please, and then, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I think uh, from the Discussion, uh, I think most of us have benefited. So, a lot of messages, a lot of the students are, I think, uh, were giving uh, congratulatory messages and, yeah, so like the presentation. Uh, not, nothing much to add to the topic. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in um, uh, Toure because we don't see actually that many cases. Uh, unless you're running a really specialized clinic, you will not see too many cases. So, those few cases that we have seen, um, I mean, most were not, I think, that severe. Probably they responded to medications and... Uh, but yes, I mean, one thing that I, I, I think uh, for um, uh, the, the postgraduates and junior um, uh, uh, faculty or uh, uh, junior uh, staff who are there, I think for them, I think HRT is one uh, therapy which is uh, very easy to learn, very easy to do if you follow the steps. Uh, I think beautifully written in the original articles itself by um, uh, Ajrin and uh, so um, I think his articles are really nice to read also. Um, simple steps, if you follow, things work. Um, nowadays, maybe um, all, like like Sir said, uh, the modifications of the same thing are coming up. Uh, like for CBT, we have now mindfulness-based techniques, so probably those things are also coming into uh, ticks, but then um, I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, whether they are more effective, less effective, difficult to say. We will not have actually big studies that way. Um, uh, so yes, I mean, I, I enjoyed the, the 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 program, the presentation, everything. So nothing much to add. So I think pass on to Haksa to uh, conclude concluding remarks. Thank you. I don't have much to say. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Ah. Not much to say, except that, you know, like, uh, whenever we get a case uh, of uh, Tourette, if possible, we should involve a clinical psychologist, a combination of both medication and therapy, that gives you a much better results. This has been a very informative um, uh, discussion, and uh, uh, I appreciate that. It has been, you know, quite educative for me. Thank you all.
Dr. Tufan, sir, your concluding remarks. Thank you. It has been a very lucid and educative lecture by Dr. Chakravarti. I compliment and I'm thankful. And as Alim has told, many people are asking for a repeat program. We look forward to that. And I again thank Dr. Chakravarti. And I am very much happy that we heard that Nizami and Samir with us to have their ex expert comments. And take home message is quite great from the three eminent psychiatrists. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Subha sir. Thank you, Tufan sir. Thank you, Hak sir. Thank you, Samir. But, but thank you all. Uh, just a minute. Just a minute. Uh, it's 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 a, it's a formal you know invitation from the Odisha State Branch. So we have Dr. Biswaranjan Mishra, who who claims he has passed from Manipal, who claims he has passed from CIP, who claims he has learned from PGI. So based on his experiences and also part of AIMS here, is a faculty here, additional professor here in AIMS. So he'll be giving the thanks in on behalf of the Odisha State Branch. Dr. Biswaranjan so Mishra. Thanksgiving also, huh? Dr. Biswa. Please unmute yourself. Please make yourself visible. Yeah, thank you. Unmute yourself, Biswa. Sir, you are unmuted. Biswa, sir. Is he audible? No, not audible, sir. Not, not clear. Mr. relax. Unmute, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Biswa. Yes. Not audible, not audible. If you can try after removing hands free, sir, or if you have not connected, you can try with hands free. As always, dependent on Sally. Anyway, we'll wait for 30 seconds. Oh, I'll thank everybody. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think... Uh, one doctor, one doctor, I mean, Dr. Yogendra is raising hands since long. Yeah, yeah, we can ask him. Dr. Yogendra Malik. Good, good evening, sir. I am the eyewitness of... Uh, HRT universal therapy and in the East disorder under the guidelines of uh, uh, my teacher. Um, uh, and uh, I saw one case of simple schizophrenia with tick disorders and uh, so many uh, other cases uh, of uh, tick dose disorders and Tourette syndrome. And one case of uh, Panda, Panda syndrome uh, with the uh, 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 complex uh, tic, tic, tic disorders and under the guidance of sir, one of my junior uh, res, uh, resident uh, done uh, four, four to six uh, case conferences conferences in uh, the PGI Chandigarh and we learned a uh, lot of them, sir and the evidence that, that the bit reversal therapy is uh, efficacious around uh, four to six percent but uh, in my case uh, so and uh, the happy reversal therapy uh, application uh, to uh, 90 uh, application. And uh, I learned uh, so many from uh, so, uh, care of my patients uh, uh, because uh, I got uh, knowledge from you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, please unmute Dr. Biswaran and Mr. Pawan. Dr. Biswa? I've again requested to unmute, sir. Him, uh, it's uh, he has to just take it. Uh, Biswa, sir, can you hear me? It's okay. So, so Dr. Hak is also uh, is logging out. So, thank you so much, Dr. Subha, sir, for accepting our invitation, giving such a wonderful presentation. It was something new.
something unique something exclusive sir thank you so much thank you dr hak he was my right. teacher i and... just say it's, it's been a pleasure my pleasure thank you very much thank you sir thank you so much thank you dr hak thank you so much thank you amrit thank you amrit for Samir. entertaining us thank you thank you dr samir for joining us dr tufan all the thanks dr biswaranjan mishra is looking very handsome with his new glasses smile dr biswar no problem so you are speaking we can't hear you you can only smile your smile is visible good night everybody good night participants thank you torrent for giving us the platform giving us the uh, next time we are coming with ocd so please tell whether we should discuss about contamination sexual obsession blasphemy or doubts the, the audience have a choice they can just fill in the chat box we'll take the chat box and then maybe next next week we have a wonderful we'll detail we'll just yeah just take ocd and try to discuss that not ocd a small part and we'll try to uh, get under uh, skin thank you everybody good night subha sir thank you again we'll meet we'll call you again sir thank you for obliging us thank you samir thank you tufan sir good night sir good night. i'm closing the meeting i think hak sir has left yes yes yeah, hak sir has left yeah okay i'll close the meeting for everyone sir yeah. yes yes close hak sir has been delayed he goes to bed at 8:30 bye bye